I am Brad Keeler. He is Sebastian Lobo Guerrero. Next on our very special St. Patrick's Day director's cut, find out how he lost his pants in the field. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Director's Cut. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute, and that is why we call this show Director's Cut. Every seven days, I interview a different GI member about themselves. They tell us stories that are personal, professional, but all of them are fun. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, I'm going to give you a little bit of an education right now. We are a technical society housed within the American Society of Civil Engineers. We have about 12,000 members. Most of them are geotechnical engineers and or geologists. As you can tell by the background that my guest has up and by the attire I have on, this would be a good time for you to look at your screen if you have not been. This is our very special St. Patrick's Day director's cut. And so I've decided to interview noted Irishman, senior (laughs) geotechnical project manager and laboratory manager at American Geotechnical and Environmental Services in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is Sebastian Lobo Guerrero. Sebastian, welcome. (laughs) Welcome. Thank you very much, Brad. Yes, I I was thinking about that. There is nothing more Irish than a Colombian, right, talking about St. Patrick's Day. But hey, I did do my homework. Not only I put that, but I, I went back and and realize that St. Patrick's is actually the saint of engineers. And, and he has a lot of credit in, in terms of engineering. He brought a lot of Roman concepts into Ireland. He was right. the first one to utilize the arch on construction techniques. He used clay for constructing churches as a material. And he was the first one to use lime as a mortar for bricks in, in Ireland. So, and all this is according to Case Western University and University of Missouri. So it is a very special day for the Geo Institute St. Patrick's Day. It's just that, that most of us didn't fantastic. know. fantastic. So you're not just learning about Sebastian here today. It's like a mini Lives of the Saints, just with just <laughs> the engineering edition. If anybody yes. had that book as a kid. <laughs> so we have 10 questions for Sebastian. Two of them are the same. Eight of them are unique. And we start with one of the ones that we ask everybody when they come on the show. Describe your job in 45 seconds. All right, so the clock, the clock is ticking. So as you mentioned, I'm a senior project manager, geotechnical project manager at AGS Inc. Uh, I'm also the laboratory manager. Uh, I do a lot of design for geotech in transportation, uh, mostly spread, you know, spread footings, deep foundations, air stabilization, you know, structures like walls, landslide stabilization. But really my day to day, it consists a lot of managing projects, mentoring younger engineers, uh, reviewing a lot of work, you know, wh- you know, guiding people doing different things, uh, doing a lot of QAQCs, obviously as a senior engineer. Uh, the lab also requires some of my time. I also spend time on marketing, business development. Obviously proposals are a big thing for me too, because we need to get the jobs, right? Especially on design build. Right. So proposal preparation. Uh, yeah, so it, I, the beauty of working in a company like Aegis is that I have the opportunity to wear many hats at the same time and do different things, uh, a lot of construction consultations. So yeah, that's in a nutshell what I do. Wonderful, comprehensive answer. Always. We ask a lot of fun questions on Director's Cut. We're gonna get right to that now. We teased this one off the beginning. This is an amazing story. It is funny story. now. What it is, is funny now. It wasn't funny at that time, but I'm ready to say it. I don't know What's if I was ready at that time. What is the funniest mistake you've ever made? Yes. So it is. It is It is funny, and I have no problem recognizing it. So it was 2008. Uh, we were we were doing a, a, a project on the other side of the state. Um, I'd rather not say the exact location. So... We were going there and we spent two days and we were supposed to go with a with a, one of my colleagues, uh, one of our senior geologists. Well, now at that time he was not, but you know, uh, and we were gonna go and, and do some geologic mapping, some, some rock cuts we were doing. The project itself kind of had some cuts on rock. It has a roadway part. It has a bridge replacement. 
And this is extremely important for the story. It had a little lake that we were doing a geosynthetic reinforced soil slope next to it. So we went there, we drove the day before, we stay in a hotel very close to the site. Uh, next day, we wake up early, went to you know what we thought it was the site, start walking around, start looking at the cuts, start doing geologic mapping. This is the best, like we actually measure all the dips, stride, discontinuities, full detail on everything. Then we went, look at the ridge. It, things start looking a little weird because the ridge looks like almost brand new. And I think that's when I say that's weird, but hey, we're in the States, you know, and, and it's a, one of the richest countries in the world. So as far as I'm concerned, they may be replacing a ridge that is brand new just because they can. So I, 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 my colleague is from Jordan, right? Al Hardawish. Uh, so we were like, yeah, that's weird, but Americans, that's what they are. And then we continue. Uh, we went where the ge geosynthetic reinforced soil was supposed to be. Uh, I think one of the primary concerns that, you know, the senior engineers in our office at that time had was settlement and, and different presence of clays because of the lake. So we go into the woods, we keep doing the area. And then I start asking my friend, where the hell is the lake? You know, because we don't see the lake that is supposed to be. And then it hit us, right? And it's like, dude, are we in the right place? You know, so we realize, and, and I, I'm, Obviously, this is before, like these days when we visit a project site, you just put the coordinates on your phone and you make sure this is before that. So we're just going with like plan and stuff. So we came out of the woods, we realized it's the wrong place, right? And and I mean, that sucks because we probably wasted like a, a good amount of time the whole morning and we were planning to drive to Pittsburgh in the back, but that probably is not the best part of the story. So recognizing the fact that we suck on that, we went to the right place, did the recon, get everything done. It was a very long day. And then we start driving back to Pittsburgh. And when we are in the car, my my coworker, my friend Al is driving, and I start seeing one tick going out of like my my sock and start climbing into my pants. It's the first thing that I saw coming to the States. I never saw ticks before. We we have ticks in Colombia, but they are not as nearly as dangerous as they are here. So I I, I show my coworker like, hey, look, I got a tick. And he's like panic mode, immediately pull on the on the side of the road. And then I, we know we dispose of the tick or whatever. Then I keep looking and I saw one more. So at that point, I, I just kind of drop it. And then we continue driving. As we continue driving, I find a third one. And we were lucky enough that we were very close in the turnpike. Anyone that is familiar with the turnpike with the Blue Mountain Plaza. So I said, you know what, just enter there, man. Let me just get off, go to the bathroom and check the rest of my pants. So I end up going there. I I count. Just at that bathroom, I counted a total of 12 ticks in my pants, different locations of my pants. I freaked out, right? I mean, this is like a terror movie, all the ticks climbing. And <laughs> so I'm like, shit, this is not going very well. So I take them off, you know, and then I was like, I'm not going to be able to take every stick out of it. So might as well just dispose the entire pants. So I opened the, the stall door, right, on my boxers. I mean, I was... I guess it's important to wear nice underwear every day. You never know what happened. <laughs> so I go on my boxers, right? And my boxer shorts. And I literally just say, there is no point. So I trash my pants. Uh, and then I was like, how the hell? I, I mean, I have my wallet in one hand, my flip phone and another, my keys. and just walking out of the plaza. <laughs> and I literally just walked the entire Blue Mountain Plaza in my, in my boxers with these things on my hand, come out to the car. Uh, Al is looking at me and he's like, what happened on that bathroom? <laughs> and it's like, why are you? Uh, fortunately enough, since it was a two-day trip, I, I did have another set of pants that I could put right there on the parking lot. Nothing classier than putting pants on the parking lot of a <laughs> Tower Pike Plaza. Uh, and then we we left. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was it was funny. I mean, well, it was a little funny at that time. For Al, it was very funny. For me, I don't think it was very funny. But it, it also shows a couple of things. The first one is, you know, what I was telling you the other day, which is, Tragedy plus time equal comedy, and and it's great to it's great to kind of think about these stories. If you ask me technical aspects of that project, I probably have forgotten most of them because it was I don't know 14 years ago or more. Uh, but I always have the stories, and then the friendships that I have with with Al, for example, they stay forever, right? And then we talk about these stories and and many other things. It, it also for me is a lesson that is important to learn because, you know, obviously this was long time ago, and we were we were kind of starting our careers, or you know. I guess in, in the early part of our career. And is that sometimes the attention to detail 
you know, it's it gets you lost and is your worst enemy. It's important to have attention to detail, but it's extremely important to never lose the big picture. And the big picture is that, you know, we should have double check, triple check that we were at the right side before we start taking readings of discontinuity of joints on bedrock, right? You know what I'm saying? So it's a lesson. It's a funny story, but it's also a lesson, I would say, for younger engineers to never lose your north, never lose the, the, the big picture because the, so the big think- picture is more important. The other thing we talked about before we started recording is that no security personnel, no employees from the rest stop from the Turnpike Authority came and talked to you when you weren't wearing pants outside. I know, I know. And that, and that leads me to believe it's insane. That their day must be way weirder than that. For me, that was insane that I was just walking boots, boxers, phone on my hand, you know, and 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 wallet, and nobody even approached me, right? Everyone is like, yeah, it's a normal thing. That happens a lot on Blue Mountain. So yeah, that's I mean, I think I got a better understanding for that sticker they put on the on the plaza that say like, you know, shirt and shoes required beyond this point. It's like, yeah, I guess some people do what I did. So yeah, I, I'm sure many like that tape, that security camera tape has to be somewhere. And you know, I will pay top dollars to see in that <laughs> Because as I said, right now I'm very relaxed about telling it. I don't think at that point I was on the, you know, on the no, same I boat. I, I can't imagine you would be. That is an amazing story, though. That's, <laughs> that's so, what an innocent question with a great, great answer. That, that's well, director's cut. I'm glad cut. you enjoyed it. Very glad you enjoyed it. So we have to ask a little bit about your, your technical expertise and your approach. Mm-hmm. I think one thing that you've mentioned and one thing that I've seen, because you've done a couple of them for us, You've had mm-hmm. kind of a unique approach to presentations since the COVID outbreak started. What yes. has been your strategy to put these together? And you mentioned that it's not just since COVID, that this is all like 15 or 20 years of work that's kind of all coming to fruition. Yes, no, I'm, I'm very glad we, we want to talk about this because it's something that is very important and special to me. So yeah, everything started, I mean, every, everyone that knows me, right, it's, I document things a lot. I, I love taking pictures. I have been doing it since I was a kid. Um, I love to remember the moments, right? And and the technical aspect, but also the group of people, everyone that was involved. So I started since the beginning of my career, I started taking like selfies, even before selfies were selfies, even before we had like Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and stuff like that. I was just taking pictures. This sounds bad, but it's just taking pictures of myself, right? <laughs> just on construction sites. <laughs> Very narcissist sound, but it was not like that. It was just, I wanted to have a memory of me at that point of my career working in this project. So I start accumulating these pictures. Uh, and then as the time passes, people start approaching me, obviously with the Geo Institute uh, was one of the first ones that say, hey, why don't you put together a presentation about like a state of the art regarding drill shafts with what you know? So I start putting these different pictures and, and stories together. And I, I, I end up developing like a base, which is what I still have, which is a presentation about drill shafts. We have another one that is driven pipes. We have another one that is geosynthetic reinforced soil slopes. Then another one that is ground anchors, another one that is micro piles. Uh, and then basically what I have been doing through all these years is that every time somebody invites me to a presentation of, of this topic, I just add recent pictures, right? I keep all my pictures for all the projects in a website. Um, and basically I just store them them. And when I have a presentation, I just look what is more recent and I keep adding to the presentations. So I think this has been going on for a while. It's just that I don't think before many people care, right? So I just have them, I keep them public for everyone. And I think when COVID hit, then things change a lot because I, I mean, even before COVID I was doing presentations, but I was probably doing four a year, maybe five a year for like the main events, uh, Geo Institute conferences, DFI conferences. I got the occasional invitation from a international conference or something. But when COVID happened, things changed because first of all, we had a lot of time, right? When we were like in lockdown and stuff. And second, it opened doors that we never even imagined they existed. So I started getting requests uh, from people that contact me on LinkedIn from Peru. I mean, last year, you're not going to believe, dude, but it's like I presented like 20 presentations in Peru. I presented in every major city of Peru and almost all the geotech programs for the, for the country. I have not been in Peru for like 25 years, right? But then it's like people contact you and it's like, hey, do, can you do a presentation for us, for this society? All virtual, right? So I start doing that, connecting with different groups, uh, getting to know people. And it, it became extremely enjoyable for me too, because... Not only I was presenting in other languages, trying to present like in Spanish, which is not something that I do that often, 
But I was also, I, my deal is always the same. It's like, I'll present and I'll give you like 30 minutes of, of my state of the art on one of these technologies. But I want to, I want to discuss with the audience, right? I want people to tell me things and I want people to say, you are crazy. You may do that in America, but that's not the way that we do, you know, micropiles yeah. in Peru. We do it on a cheaper way. And so it's always nice to have that feedback and then learn from them the same way they're learning from me. It also has many other connotations. Like I presented a lot in, in you know, in, in, in Peru, as I said, and Colombia last year, but it's also kind of connecting to my background too. Like I've been in the States for 20 years and most of my career have been in the States. So it's also a nice opportunity to go and connect with other engineers uh, that are basically where I was 20 years ago and learn from that. And, and, and since then it has taken, last year was insane. I mean, my wife re reminds me of the number all the time because I did 42 presentations in a year, which in a year that has 52 weeks, right? So it's almost once a yeah. week, but it, it's, I don't know, I think it's extremely cool to you know, to do that. And then, you know, and then it's also like the challenge of, okay, I want to present in every single country of South America. So I have my little map and I'm checking places. I'm doing Bolivia next week and, and hopefully it will keep going. I mean, I, I did Brazil too, actually in person. And I mean, you know me well, and there is nothing cooler than geotech conferences. I mean, all around, I know it's the, the, the nerdiest, geekiest answer you can hear, <laughs> but it's just at, at the age of 40, 243, for me, the most enjoyable thing is going to a new place, a new city that I have never been before, have a geotech conference, learn from other people in the region, learn from the presentations, see local projects. It's just the whole thing. So this is something that is extremely, extremely enjoyable. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on in the interview here. And you mentioned that you've been here about 20 years. Mm -hmm. You arrived in the U.S. I didn't realize it was this close until we talked about it earlier, a month before the September 11th attacks. How did that change your outlook about being in the U.S.? I mean, it must yes. have been it must have been shocking. Yeah, I mean, it was it was because keep in mind, I mean, I came from Colombia, right? Colombia in the 80s and 90s. It really was a beautiful country. I mean, it's, it's, it's the paradox because. I cannot imagine a, a better childhood that I had, the most beautiful childhood. I mean, it's it's not only geographically a beautiful place, but the people and the culture, it, it's, it's beautiful. But at the same time, the 80s and the 90s, it was probably the most dangerous place in the world, right? I mean, you have the drug cartels and you have the guerrillas. Uh, my dad was kidnapped when I was growing up on an engineering project. I mean, we even do a whole podcast about it. But anyway, like, you know, I, I was very privileged and I was in a very safe area and a safe part of the country but still with that you get exposed to a lot of this violence and and things like that uh when i came to the states I, obviously what i came here was to study right to do my masters and my phd uh but one of the nice bonuses that i always felt is like well i'm coming to the states which is the safest place in the world right so i don't have to keep worrying about like safety and then less than a month then this happened right and i just remember thinking like dude i did i came to the wrong place at the wrong time uh but I mean, jokes apart, obviously, my situation was nothing compared to what the families of 3,000 victims had or, you know, yeah. during, during that time. I think it, it, it changed the view of, of this country. It definitely changed the view of the world. I think the appreciation for what we had, you know, and, and, and what this country has constructed kind of came back. I mean, a lot of positives came out of it's a tragedy and, and obviously nothing can replace the lives that were lost. Right. And, and, and that is something that always have to be remembered. I think when we had the 20-year anniversary and, and all that, it's it's symbolic. I, I I love New York City and I go often, and I remember visiting in a few months after that, and, and it was extremely impactful and devastating, you know, just to see like what was there. So I think it changed life. I think it changed life forever, for every you know, for for Americans, for people that are outside America, and 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 for everyone that somehow it marked a generation. I, I honestly believe it it marked our generation. I absolutely agree with that. I remember thinking at one point in 2002, I wonder how many years it will be before I go a whole day without thinking about that. Yeah. And it was a long time. I don't remember exactly when it was that it happened, but I mean, it was several years for sure. Yeah. 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 It is. I think it has stayed on the collective for a while. And yeah. And I think, I mean, obviously it also brought the terrorists, the terrorists in part of it. And, and that's something that I mean, obviously, growing in Colombia, we 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 live with the fear of the terrorism, right? And then coming in the states, it was kind of like, okay, well, now this country is kind of, in some respect, going through the same, which is the the fear, the constant fear of of things. Uh, but I mean, I also have to say that it's amazing the 
the response that America as a country had. I mean, it impresses me tremendously at, 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 you know, at those days, like how people rally together and say, like, we are not going to we're not going to be defeated by fear. Right. It's like fear is not going to take the best out of us and we're going to continue life and and we're going to. Yeah, we're going to win this and, and our win is to go back to 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 have, you know, like a like a normal way of, of living. So, yeah, man, we got serious pretty quick. We, we jumped know, from fix on my pants to, to this. <laughs> we have to turn it all the way around now and be yes. much more lighthearted. And we have to ask another fun question. What store could you shop in every single day and never get tired of it? Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. Uh, I'll actually give you two because one is not a store. So I will say my 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 go to has always been the the University of Pittsburgh store. I live I live between Pitt and Carnegie Mellon here in in, in Pittsburgh in Oakland, and it is walking distance. And I love everything Pitt related. I mean, not only because it's the place that I went and did my master's and PhD, but my my son goes to Folk, which is the is the school for the School of Education. I mean, he's only you know he's only seven years old, but it's related to that. So I love Pete on every single way, and I happen to believe that they have the best colors in the world, like the royal blue and the yellow. It, it really gives for the best clothes. So I do, I do spend a lot of time there. Uh, I think I, I buy more stuff to give away to friends than to keep because I already have too much, <laughs> and and my wife kind of say that enough is enough. But I, I would say that if I can pick another one, because I think that's another thing that changed a lot with the you know with the years of COVID and all that, which is I don't think that I spend that much money on buying things that are shallow and, and, and superficial in some respect because yeah. I think my perspective changed a lot, you know, in, in, in many things. But one of the cool things also that came is the all the stuff that you are doing and the Geo Institute is doing with the student fund, which I know is not a store, but to me it became kind of a store because you guys have done amazing stuff. Like last year with the silver anniversary, right? Having the pins that if you give a donation you can get the pin, having the polo, the anniversary, which is it, I mean it's a freaking Adidas polo with the Geo Institute logo. It's like like that's the best that you can have. It's the best of clothes that you can have. Uh, and then following later with the with the 96 club, right? And then having the special pin on that, the Tersagi bowl head. So I mean I don't want to sound like a commercial for what you guys do, but I do love everything you are doing because those are the kind of stuff that bring a lot of happiness to my life. And and everyone that is close to me knows that I typically I wear like geotech swag. You know, like I mean I'm I'm wearing my Geo Institute Pittsburgh <laughs> sweater. But like for me, like when people get like all excited I mean when you see teenagers getting excited about like wearing Nike shirts and like just having brands and stuff, for me that is like DFI shirts, Geo Institute shirts. So that would be something that I would never get tired of keeping, you know, keeping donations and buying all the stuff that you guys are kind of coming with, which are well, great Well, we appreciate ideas, that. And, you know, of course, everybody watching this next week at Geo Congress in Charlotte, you will be able to obtain all of that stuff at the GI yeah. booth. Stop by. We will have signs up. We will have people there to help you along to make your donation. Sebastian mentioned the Terzaghi bobbleheads, the 25th anniversary pins. Since we didn't go anywhere last year, we still have 25th anniversary <laughs> pins. They will be available for you. So don't worry about being a commercial, Sebastian. Yes. And, and so just to I, I actually got extra pins, you know, because I think depending on different donations, you get one pin. And if you go more, you get more. But anyway, I end up having a lot of pins. So I'm actually going to Colombia and giving some away to friends that are also on Geotech. So trying to spread the love. It's an awesome logo with the 25. And I do collect the pins of the Geo Institute, as you know, uh, and, and I have my collection for the 10 year pin and all that. So a lot of special things. Very nerdy. Very so you'll geeky. want to uh, we're going to have some retro ones available at GeoCong. Oh. It's in the booth. We're going to have oh, a man. silent save, option save there and people can those. bid on those. Yes, it's going to be absolutely. pretty exciting. Yes, absolutely. So the other question we have to ask everybody when they come on the show, and I know you're going to have a good answer for this one. How did you first get involved in ASCE and GI? Well, it's actually related to the previous one about 9-11. So what happened is I came to Pittsburgh thanks to Dr. Luis Vallejo. He was my advisor. He's the one that recruited me in Colombia when I was finishing my studies there. On Geo I mean, I was finishing my undergrad, but I was doing a lot of classes in geotech. I met him there because he was doing a summer class. He wrote me here. Uh, I started working. So I arrived this country August 14, 2001. So as soon as the semester started, 
uh, he was big into AGC and the Geo Institute. So he told me, you know, there is this group that gets together and they do geotech presentations and, and things like that. You should, you should consider going to one of those. So it also happened to be that because of 9-11, then they were doing one about the foundations of 9-11, like the bathtub and explaining about the world. So it was extremely interesting. And one of the things that Dr. Vallejo emphasized the most is it was a free dinner. And that also got me because at that time, a free dinner meant a lot. So <laughs> it was at the PAA, which is the Pittsburgh Athletic Association right next to the campus, walking distance. And I just remember thinking, I'm hooked into this thing. Like I go there, I meet the professionals of geotech in Pittsburgh, right? Plus the academia. It's walking distance from where I live, right? It's a beautiful venue. So it connects me to everything and it gives me a free, a free meal. So I remember since that day thinking, I'm going to come to every single Geo Institute event that happened. And, I mean, and, and that love obviously when, when I went to the first short course, I mean, that's one of the things that I said is so important to sponsor students. Because I did my first short course there, uh, like, you know, in the, in the Pittsburgh section, we have a short course every year, an eight hour short course. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe that they let me attend that for like $10, right? And then I got my binder of, you know, of, of the class. And, and I don't know, it was, to me, it was so exciting that a group of professionals recognize the importance of getting students engaged into this and, and, and share all this knowledge. So, yeah, so I attended all of those. And then obviously when, when I graduated, I, I went into the world. I was the, I was the president for a while. Then I moved into the city, you know, like ASE city level and, and things like that. But I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful organization. It's a great initiative that has always been. And, and, and as I say, I will always support anything with regarding the students, because I think that's the way, that's the, the way that I got here. Right. So and for all our student members out there watching, it really is a great thing to do. Find your local group. Most of the time you can attend the monthly meetings either free or for almost free. I think mm -hmm. the ones here locally in the D.C. and Baltimore chapter are ten dollars or sometimes five dollars if you want to go. So I would definitely recommend doing that. Follow Sebastian's lead. We'll put a link down in the show notes so you can find the chapter closest to where you are. We haven't asked a specific Pittsburgh question yet, Let's and I it. felt like we needed to, and we it's going to involve food, um, which I like. Anybody who's been to Pittsburgh and specifically Oakland, though, I guess for this one, Primanti Brothers or Essie's? Quick, Primanti's all day long. Primanti's is one of my favorite, my favorite places in, in Pittsburgh for people that are not, you know, I guess that they have not seen it. It's a... Uh, it looks kind of gross, but it's paradise in a sandwich. I mean, it's basically you put the sandwich, you put the fries inside, right? And then you put the coleslaw. It ends up being like a mountain like this. Uh, but if I can do some advertisement for Primantis, go with the Capicola cheese. It's awesome. It's excellent. Try the roast beef. It's also excellent. And if you are in the aging drink, you know, like if you can drink, you're an age that you can drink, absolutely have it with an Iron City beer, which is the is one of the local beers. Uh, it's it's a great dish, but it's also a lot of tradition. Uh, when I was finishing my PhD, because I was graduating in May, in the end of April, but I could only work starting beginning of May because of visa requirements, I defended my thesis about in January. So I have like three months of my life, which is the only three months of my life that I was not really working like crazy. My advisor already say like, you know, take these three months kind of like easy because then you're going to start working and it will be the rest of your life. So which happened. So I started doing a lot of research at the Carnegie Library about the city. And I started watching a lot of documentaries, but uh, a producer, a local producer that then became a good friend in life, which is called Rick Siwak. And he has done like different documentaries about the history of the city, history of neighborhoods. It's all on PBS and WQED. Uh, and then he has one about the strip district and Primantis in general. And then that's when I learned the story about Primantis that, you know, it started like a, like a place for breakfast or for like a late snack for truckers that were delivering the goods for the strip district. And it was a, it was a, quick, dirty, easy sandwich, uh, relatively inexpensive that they could do. And and then it kind of developed into all these stores and then it became a hipster thing. So right now it's like Primanti is super <laughs> fashionable, but the initial part was not like that. And, and, and knowing the history of all that is, it's, it's excellent. My wife is not a big fan of it because I think it's kind of greasy food and it may not be the best food. My son, even my son say that it's unhealthy, which always kicks me, right? But it's like, what kind of example I'm giving? So really what it, what it happens is we have clothes that is one that is close to our place. So I typically weekends just go walk, I mean, order online, walk there, 
you know, go and pick up my little bag in at, at the pit campus and then come back and, and eat it here. But it's it's a delicious sandwich and you are celebrating Pittsburgh history in a bun. So I will leave you with that part. Mine mine is uh, corned beef and pastrami. So you got, I feel like you got to get both. Like it, yes. it's just it's got a nice kick to it and it goes with the coleslaw on there. Oh, well, I, next people, time ne- right, ne- people look at it and they're horrified, but it's such a good combo. Yes. Ne- next time you visit Pittsburgh, I'll, I'll tell you and we try to expand on the menu and, and have many, many of those. And as I say, <laughs> the, 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 the IC beer, it's extremely important. It makes the flavor, you know, 10 times better. So. Man, we should get some royalty or some, some kind of payment from Primanti. We're doing a lot of advertisement here. <laughs> when when we start our GI food show, when we travel yes. the country, we, there will have to be a Pittsburgh stop. Exactly. So we, we have three questions left here to go. And this one I felt like was very important to ask. So your, your dad is a civil engineer. You mentioned yeah. that earlier. And I think anybody who knows you at all knows this. <laughs> so that tends to make kids... You either f- want to follow in their footsteps or you want to go far away and do you something else. Yes. yes. And you decided to become a civil engineer. Was there a moment that you knew you wanted to do it? Two moments. The first one pretty quick. The second one has a funny story about it. Yeah, the, I, I think I, I, I realized my dad was uh, he was a contractor, right? Not much designer. He he did his undergrad in Purdue with a scholarship. So he came from Colombia to Purdue in Indiana. He studied here and he returned to the country. He worked on construction all his life, and towards the end of his career, he went independent, and that's probably most of my childhood when he was independent. So I grew up going to construction sites, right? And and I didn't really even know that it was something else than civil engineering because my grandfather was also a civil engineer. Wow. So my grandfather was the opposite of my dad. He was the design aspect of it, very exact calculations. Uh, I All the memories that I have of him are with a tie. You know, like the, the, the engineers from the 20s, 30s, right? Well, my dad was on the other side, which was more like on the construction side. So uh, I grew up like loving every single job site, learning how to, you know, how to operate dozers and excavators at a young age. So I think one of the first one is like being really a kid and realizing that I admire my grandfather and my dad so much that I wanted to be one, right? Uh, and that, those are the pictures that I have on like on Facebook and LinkedIn that is like me as a... AG are all doing recons on rock slides with my camera. But, but I think that's kind of like the memory of how things started. But the, the specific memory that I have about saying I want to do geotech is because 1994, it's like I even remember the month. It was June of 1994. My dad was doing a, he was doing a kind of like a design build on a road construction. And this road had a cut, a very big cut on rock. And it was kind of like on a curve. And the way that the contract was put together, you could select the slope of the cut and it was based on means and methods how you excavate the material and basically provide that that and i'm talking that this is a cut that is probably i don't know 500 feet tall right on a very competent sandstone so we went there with my dad and some geologists uh one day and then we look at that they they did the geologic mapping they look they look what was kinematically possible from the rock mechanics point of view and they decided that they could go with an almost vertical cut they said, okay, that part was interested me a ton because I was like, how people can just come here and do some measurements. Uh, and, and that's kind of really the day that I learned about jointing and, and bedding and, you know, what is kinematically possible or what the hell is kinematically as a word. But anyway, so that's kind of when I learned those concepts. So that's part that in, immediately brought me into the field, the theory behind, you know, the friction, the wedges, the all the who can break book and all that that we do all the time in rock mechanics. But then the part that completely sold me was what happened after that, because then they said, okay, then we need to cut it. Uh, we cannot rip it with a with a regular equipment. We need to really blast it, right? But then the problem is, being 1994, that's one of the most dangerous in Col- years in Colombia. You could not have dynamite as a contractor. It was a very complicated process to get dynamite to do like pre-splitting and do a, a whole construction, because obviously if you get dynamite, then it could go into the hands of the guerrillas and, and the drug lords yeah. and all that. So. One of the guys that was present at that meeting said that he he said, well, I work in another contract with another company a few years ago, and we end up fabricating our own explosives. So uh, imagine being at that age, like, what, dude? Fabricating our own explosives? Like, he completely got me. And then he says something like, yeah, there is a lot of stuff that you can buy, like, in supermarkets. And I don't remember what is the specific components. I probably am not even allowed to tell you specific components on a, on, a, on an interview like this. But anyway, he came with a list 
And he was like, I think if we buy this, we can do it. So anyway, the, the instructions were given, the action items were given, we were gonna meet the next week, right? And, and everyone was bringing what was supposed to. We did that, we went a week after, we got all the ingredients and then literally we start doing like drilling some holes on the rock, right? On the upper part of the cut and loading this thing with these ingredients. And then we start doing the blasting test and it worked, man. It's like, it's, it was a very low energy dynamite, but it still made it enough that we could, that they were able to blast the rock, right? And then during the next months, it was basically just taking this cut down, 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 making the right away. So I think for me, that was the experience that completely sold me because it's the, and, and when I look at what I do today, I mean, obviously I cannot use explosives and make my own explosives in Pennsylvania, but it, it is really what I am because it's this deep understanding of the theory, right? On the bedding, how, what is the design that you need to do? What are the main variables? How you control them? Do you need to put soil nails, bolts, or, you know, how can you make the cut? But then that's half of the problem. But the other half, which is what I love working on design build with contractors directly is, how do I do this? I mean, what equipment do I need to bring here from what side of access, you know, how, how I make this a reality? Because uh, growing up also with my dad, it's, it's, it's funny because he always criticized like, you know, inspectors and design engineers because he was always like, these guys have no clue what they're doing, right? I am the one here doing the roadway. So I always thought I was gonna be in construction and I always thought that I was gonna hate design engineers. And then my life turned around and I became a design engineer, right? And so it's like, I, I will always feel like, I don't even know if my dad looks at me with respect. <laughs> but I'm saying, because, I mean, obviously he does, I'm just joking. But what I'm saying is in civil engineering, you have to be on both sides, right? And, and, I, and I think that's the, the great, great geotech engineers, the, the mentors that I always see, they have to combine both. There is not a good geotech engineer that has not spent enough time on the field, enough time on the lab, and enough time just doing calculations, right? You have to have it all. So that to me is a very round, you know, like experience that definitely that was, this is what I want to do with my life. And and this is pretty much, I mean, I, I think I also kind of saw, this is pretty much what I want to be, right? It's like, I have a clear path. I mean, I have a 10 years of, of education with master's PhDs and then 20 years of experience, but you know, it's the, it's the, it's the beauty of arriving to the point that you always wanted to be, right? That yeah. that's yeah. And I mean, I don't know. Without getting too into tangent, uh, my wife's birthday was recently, and with my son, we just bought him a, a, a little book. It's a little book that just have like famous sentences about like the process of getting old, right? As you can imagine, she hated the gift. For her, it was the most offensive gift that you can give. But <laughs> I was reading one that is actually a statement from from I think it's David Bowie, and it says that getting older. You know, it's it's just the extraordinary process of becoming the person that sh you should have yeah. always been. And really, that part is the awesomeness of getting old, which is you really become what you always wanted to be, but it's just you need to pass these different stages until getting there. So it's it's kind of funny. I never really intend for this to happen, but sometimes these interviews end up with a theme that runs all the way <laughs> through them. And I think yours has really been like learning, right? Yes. And that th we're going to keep going with that. The, mm -hmm. the final two questions fit right into that. I want to ask you another question. It's not really a question about Columbia, but it, it sort of is here. What's something that you think civil engineers in the U.S. could learn from Colombian engineers? I know you mentioned earlier when you talked to the group in Peru um, that it, experiences like that have made you a little bit more creative and seen other solutions that maybe we wouldn't think about here in the States. So what do, what do you think we can learn? Yeah, I mean, I, I will start saying that, I mean, obviously I do have a tremendous amount of respect and you you see where this is coming. So I, I do have a, a, a tremendous amount of respect for American engineers and American geotechnical engineers. I mean, I, I do believe from the bottom of my heart that the, the geotech education that you can get in the States is the best in the world. I mean, I think everyone that, that, that is, don't take me wrong, for international audience, there is great programs in Europe, there is great programs in, 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 many, in many places, but to me, really, it's the States is, is the perfect combination because in this country, you receive an education on the theoretical aspects and, and you can go through programs, do your master's and PhD on geotech, getting a lot of great fundamentals. But there is also the, the recognition that the field matters a lot and the lab matters a lot. So it's a perfect combination. So I, I think geotech engineers from this country are very capable and and really, you know, the best of the best. Uh, similar, we are in a country that has the money 
to invest in infrastructure. So that also generates opportunities, right? So not only you have great programs and people coming through those programs, but you also have jobs for them. So that, that part is extremely important. However, and that's all the introduction for my however, however, there is something that Colombian engineers have and, and geotech engineers in, in, in particular, which is part is the hunger, right? I mean, we, we did not have the opportunities that are here, right? Uh, a lot of my good friends in geotech that end up doing PhDs in the States, we have to, I mean, don't take me wrong. I'm not saying that I'm a fighter and, you know, I have to smoke people around, but it, I grew up in Colombia with access to a lot of things that the vast majority of the country never had, right? I got a college education that many of, of, of people in Colombia simply don't have the opportunity to have, right? And then I, I was able to get scholarships in the US, which again, you keep you keep kind of making the, the, the market smaller, but I think the process, so I, I'm, I'm by no standard, I'm saying that I have a hard life. No, at all, the opposite, right? But going through the process and have to fight for your things. I mean, try to have to fight for a scholarship and, 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 and keeping a, you know, a, an average so you can continue on a PhD. It makes you hungry and it makes you, it makes you always want more, never settle for anything. And every engineer in geotech that I know from Colombia that end up coming here, it's that attitude of, you are not going to stop me. I'm going to find a solution. I, I'm, I'm always going to solve the problem. I'm always going to keep advancing my career. I'm never going to get comfortable. Never. Like as soon as I feel that I'm comfortable doing something, I need to move into something else. Right. And, and, and you can see great examples of this in companies around, you know, around the U.S. You have David Espinosa and Geos in tech. Just look at the career that David has had. I mean, he has done everything. He taught at Purdue and he went and you know, he graduated from Purdue and then he went and, and, and started the office in Richmond and, and look where he is. He did the geotech and he was tired and then he went into environmental. And when he knew everything about environmental, he moved into finance, right? Uh, and then you have Jose N. Gomez in Florida. I mean, it's so many examples and you can see that attitude of, of never stopping, always keep going and, and things like that. So that also kind of involves what you were alluding before, which is, Think outside the box, right? I mean, Ashto and FHWA is not the response, is not the answer for everything. You always have to challenge new ways to do things, new ideas. Obviously, you have to be responsible, right? Because the codes exist because of a reason. So you have to be responsible to make sure that you are still doing things that make sense, that can be constructed. But you always have to kind of look for new ways. And, and I think that's something that you know, Colombian engineers, because of our background and, and the way that we got opportunities, we, we always have that. Uh, you, you will never be stuck on a project with a Colombian engineer. That, I can guarantee you that. And you will also never have a great time as with a Colombian engineer, because we, we <laughs> tend to drink a lot and enjoy conferences and enjoy projects and talk a lot. So as you can see on the interview. <laughs> and the final question sort of goes back together with all these. Uh, you've mentioned conferences a couple of times, and uh, I know you're a big cheerleader for Geo Congress and for the DFI annual meeting, just to name two. We have a lot of members who attend their regional conferences or their local meetings, and that's about it. There are a lot of people who will have never been to Geo Congress because they think it's not for them. Why do you think Geotech should attend national conferences like that? What 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 do you get from it? Yes, I mean, why why not? I'm, I guess the first thing you you kind of hit into something that is important, which is you start local, right? I mean, like we went through the process that I went in the Geo Institute. I got involved as a student, then I start getting involved when I start working on different things, the short courses. Most people go through that course, even if they are not part of the let's say of the world itself, but they start attending the short courses, right? And now since the last 10 years or whatever that we need the PDAs on our on our licenses, right? We need to get the, you know, these classes and these development hours. So you start attending the local ones and it's great because we also have speakers that we bring on the different chapters, like not only the Pittsburgh chapter, but every chapter in the country brings different speakers and they present about projects that are not only local. So with the local events, the local conferences, you learn about the local characteristics and a little bit about the others around the country. And, and that's OK. Don't take me wrong on what I'm going to say. That is OK for a little bit. Right. That's OK. What you create, you cannot. It's also expensive. You cannot just take a junior engineer that only started a year ago and send this person, you know, he or she around the country 
to five conferences a year. I mean, it, no company is going to do that because it's expensive. So it's important that you start there. But then you got to a point that you really need to start going to more national conferences and, and, and not even stop there, international conferences too. Because that's when you really get two things. The first one, you start networking, networking and making contacts at a higher level. Right. You are now not only on your region, but you are also looking national wide. Uh, and then also you are learning about different regions. That there, there is nothing better than go to a conference in a place that you have not been and go there and get completely immersed in projects that are from there. I mean, I think every big conference have case studies from different regions, but it has a very solid section on local case histories. So you will benefit from that. You will learn a lot. You will meet people. You will have crazy stories because there is nothing better than being in a conference and getting out and go, you know, go to different restaurants, food and and, and meet friends. Uh, I mean, when I look back, this has been my life, honestly, dude. And, and that's the reason that I love it so much, because this is what I have been doing for the last 25 years of my life. I mean, I, I since the moment I remember the day that I discovered the concept of geotech conferences that are national nationwide. I was in Colombia and on the library or, or, or not the library, but like the. No, actually, yeah, it was the library of my old university. I discovered the shelf that was proceedings for different conferences around the world. And I couldn't believe the concept of like, so people travel, talk about geotech and, you know, and it's part of work. It's like, wow, and, and, and probably your employer pays for that. So I, I got hooked into that since the day that I started my, my master's. I told that to my advisor. Uh, fortunately, he was a big fan of conferences. So really, I start traveling, you know, I mean, I went to Alaska very early on my on, on my career, I guess, or, you know, for a rock mechanics conference. I saw stuff there that is extremely impressive. I did some in the UK, some in Europe, uh, and then start, you know, going obviously around the, the US. Uh, and, and part of the, to me that has been very interesting in the, in the most recent years is in 2019, probably one of the best conferences that I have attended in my life, I got invited as a keynote lecturer on the National Conference of Geotech in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. They organized it in CEFE, at that time it was the ninth edition. They organized it about three or four years, you know, so it's a very special event. I got the honor to close the conference with the final keynote. Um, and it's funny because they always thought, like they were thinking like, okay, if you want to come the day before, spend the night in Sao Paulo, uh, you can give your keynote and then leave the other day. And I was like, hold on your horses. I want to go for the entire thing, right? I mean, I'm not going to just come here for my lecture. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, I know what I'm presenting. I want to learn from what others are presenting. So I actually went there early, even before the conference, right? And then I watched all the conferences before me. And I was completely blown away because as a big fan of like soil nail stabilization, rock anchors, soil anchors, I could not believe the, the projects they were working on. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the, the magnitudes of yeah. things. I mean, uh, I, I even asked the question, I say, I mean, you guys are aware that you are completely violating all the ASHO, ASHTO, FHWA, any kind of codes that exist, right? But somehow you are presenting a project that is still standing today, right? So that shows how much we have to still to learn. Obviously, they have a lot of sections on failures, right? Because that also happened when you push the limit too much. But but I don't know, for me, it, it was it was awesome. Not that much. I mean, my presentation was cool and all that, but for me, it was just seeing all these other things. And and also, I don't know, it's a, it's a great experience, you know, being another culture, uh, experiencing, you know, getting to know other people, getting to know other companies, a, other professional societies. I mean, everyone thinks, I can guarantee you right now, there is a similar conversation like the, the two of us are having for a geotechnical society in another country. We all, we are all the same at the end. So it's nice to, you know, now it's also great for another reason. I do collect geotech books in different languages, just, I don't really use them much, but I have my bookshelf. So every time that I go to an international conference or another conference in another city and I see any kind of publication about local conditions, I always buy it. So, I mean, I, I really believe conferences are, is the way for you to also keep involved in the industry, keep learning. If we have to leave something on this interview, it's the importance of learning because that really is the way that I yeah. define myself. I will never get tired of learning and I will always attend any course or anything that I can that I can learn from. And I think that's really what brought me into the field. You know, always wanted to know more about it and always, and I think that's the way that you have to live your career. Never settle, but never believe that you know enough because that's really when when mistakes happen. When, when you get to a point that you're comfortable and you think that you really can do without, you know, without learning more and, and you can just do with the tools that you have. You know, I mean, we are only as good as the last project that we did. 
and we're only as good as the, lo the local geology that we have. Because if I put you now in the middle of Australia, your years of experience are going to mean <laughs> zero. So never get to a point that you believe that you are so good that you don't have to keep learning. And that's my final I, message, I hope. Well, I think it's almost final, right? The, what a hey, great let's way keep it to, to close it out. <laughs> well, we have we have to have two bonus questions here. They're quick ones. Mm -hmm. So one is you got to tell everybody, you know, very quickly, your favorite spot on the Pitt campus. My favorite spot in the Pitt campus. Uh, I have to say it is Cathedral of Learning, just because what it represents. Uh, for those that are not familiar, Cathedral of Learning is the... It's basically a huge tower that is in Pitt. It was the it was the tallest educational building in the world in 1937. It was constructed in the 20s and 30s, uh, finalized in 1937. The idea that they have is that they were going to have the entire university in one building. It was a, such a revolutionary concept because instead of being spread on a campus, you were going to have a vertical campus, right? Didn't last for too long because the university outgrew very fast. Uh, but it has so much, I mean, they have done a really good job documenting the construction of it, uh, especially, obviously, for me, the foundations. They have a really good set of pictures showing everything. Uh, but it also goes more than that because the first two floors, and I know you have been there and, and you like them a lot, uh, the nationality rooms are, are really something yeah. special because it's that blend of cultures. And I, I think Shirley actually talked about this too. Yep. It, it's a, it's a really good spot, but if I have to pick one spot on all this, it actually will not even be on the nationality rooms, but it will be if you go to the, the 36th floor, because the view that you get from that place of the entire Pitt campus is, is it's astonishing. Also, well, right now it's very open for everyone. You know, it, it's very open for everyone that wants to go there and, and see it. They actually put like a little, you know, like a little, some couches and stuff. But when I came to Pitt, it was not like that. When I came to Pitt, the 36th floor was just the last floor you could go, but it was nothing special about it. Uh, and, and, and I used to, I remember I used to go late at night, especially after like drinking or something like that, and just go there and just look the city from there and, and, and be just so impressed and marvelize how, how awesome the Pitt campus is and, and really Pittsburgh as a city. So. It's a very cool experience. I would also recommend the cathedral to anybody who's in Pittsburgh. If you haven't been there, you should check it out. The final bonus question that we have to ask is after such a great season this year, What's the outlook for Pitt football in 2022? Oh man, that's great. Yes, I, I do became quite a Pitt fan. And actually because of my advisor, because he was a, he's also a very good Pitt fan. So yeah, I mean, last last season was the top, you know, the cherry on top. I, it's, I think we didn't really thought that it was gonna be, or, or the season before, it was supposed to be the best season ever because you have, you know, you still have the great players and you have the defensive line commitment to come back for one more year. Uh, it happened to me that it was like the COVID year, the first COVID year. So, you know, that was kind of like not the first start, but I don't know, for some reason, nothing really went well. We all kind of didn't really have many hopes. Then Kenny Pickett announced he was coming back for one more season, which I never thought it was going to happen. Uh, and I think that's when the excitement started building up. And then it's like, well, things may work well, right? But then we were still kind of on a letdown from the previous season that we have so many expectations. And then things start going as a dream. I mean, that, that season is going to be a movie one day because, you know, like game by game, things start getting better. And then we got the Clemson win, right? Which is such a rival that has yeah. always given us a hard time, well, except in 2016 when we won. But anyway, like the season start getting, uh, I spared no cost when it was the final, you know, I mean, we basically got what? We got the ACC Coastal, right? And then we we have the opportunity to win it at home. And I remember like, I, I have been going for, to pit games for more than 20 years, right? I was like, this is it. I mean, I have been with season tickets on and on. I mean, I, last year I didn't have season tickets. And I was like, this is the time, man. If we get a freaking trophy at Heinz Field, you know, for, for Pitt would be amazing. So I actually end up having, I end up buying like probably the most expensive tickets that I have bought in my life. Uh, we got three tickets with my wife and son on the, it was like right on the 50 yard line, like the fourth row. And then I got to experience the best thing, which is them winning the, you know, like the ACC Coastal and getting the trophy at Heinz Field, you know, and all the fans in the stands. And it also kind of represented everyone coming after, you know, like a season of no fans in the stands. Yeah. It was it was awesome. Then it continued to the ACC final, you know, in in when when we played with Forest and, and that one I didn't go, but I stay here because I feel that it was actually even going to be even more awesome to see it 
at home. You know what I'm saying? Like in Pittsburgh, and yeah. it was incredible. I mean, it, like when they won it, right? And everyone went to the streets and it was, I mean, it was epic. Just seeing Cathedral of Learning in a, on, a, on a sea of heads and everyone just saying, let's go Pitt. It really was perspective for my 20 years in Pitt, you know, and, and, and seeing we finally got this. Uh, and then we went to the pitch ball, which was supposed to be awesome. Uh, I already have a planned trip with my family to Legoland, so we couldn't go, which I thought it was the biggest mistake that I could not go to that game. Things went downhill pretty quick on that game. I mean, Kenny Pickett <laughs> didn't play and yeah, Nick Patty got injured like in the first touchdown. So we ended up losing against Michigan State, but it's OK. I mean, the other the other two were extremely good awards that we got and, and it's good. So coming out this year, who knows? I mean, I, I hope for the best, but I know Pete and I have no Pete for a while and we tend to be quite irregular. So it's kind of like, we'll see. I mean, I, I hope that with all this recent success, we are very, you know, we have a motivated team with a lot of great talent that has been coming because, you know, and Aaron Donald has been a great figure for recruiting and he's super committed with the university. You know, he give a donation for the facilities. He trains here during the off season. So it seems that the Pete program attracts a lot of a, a great, great players. So. I hope it's gonna go well, but I still have my reserves because I have been following them for a long time. So, I, but it doesn't matter, you know. That's the beauty of being a pit fan. It's like we go, we celebrate. We are the underdogs always. So if we get a, an amazing win a season, that makes our season. So <laughs> it's so a thanks for night. the thanks for the forecast there and for your favorite spot. And that brings us to a close again, that theme of learning all the way through amazing answers from Sebastian. If you liked what you saw today, viewers click subscribe, click get notifications. We will let you know every single time we post something to our YouTube channel, which is super frequently. And we hope you stick around and watch some of our other great stuff. You can see Sebastian in person at Geo Congress in Charlotte. He has been super active over the last couple of years in Geo Congress. You can see him again in person. He is the chair of the DFI annual meeting this year, which will be in National Harbor, Maryland, just miles from beautiful Washington, D.C. So Sebastian, thanks for being with us today. This was a lot of fun. No, it's a lot of fun and, and I really appreciate it. Uh, I do follow, you know, Director Cott and I do watch all the other interviews and I'm honored that you invited me because there is great geo personalities that have passed to the show. And I think it's a testament to stand there in YouTube for a while and, and, and it's very cool to be associated with it. So I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity. Well, thanks for all your answers and for our viewers, thanks for sticking around and we will see you with a brand new Director's Cut taped at Geo Congress next week. Yes, so I'm sure that there is, is some amazing. security. I'm sure there is some security tape of that, you know, that the Blue Mountain Turnpike Plus still have. But, you know. but at the same time, right? Can you imagine the stuff that they see on those yeah, security sure cameras? Is, yeah. <laughs> like, like there were probably ten weirder things that yes. day that I mean, happened the, at that rest stop. The, the fact for me that nobody approached me while I was walking out on my boxers. It means that it's more than common, you know what I'm saying? It's, yeah, so it, it is what it is. I think it's just like, you know, they, they probably have a bet on how many people they're going to see that day with no pants on. And Yeah, I mean, it like sometimes you see that at the entrance of the plaza, it says shoes and shirt, like shoes and t-shirt required beyond this point. It's like, who the hell is going to enter a Thornpike Plaza without a shirt? So that's what I